Cornell University, where he's in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology. He did his PhD study. Uh, he actually did his BS at the University of Minnesota, so he's a, a hometown boy. And then he did his PhD studies at uh, Colorado. And uh, during those PhD studies, he also worked at the University of Basel uh, for part of his work. And then he did a postdoctoral fellowship with uh, Francis Arnold at Caltech. And he started his uh, independent uh, career at Princeton in 2015. And he re recently moved to Cornell. His group is known for the development of methods in photoenzymatic catalysis. And my PhD studies a long time ago involved photochemistry and organometallic chemistry. So I find his combination of using photochemistry to get enzymes to catalyze a different kind of reaction to be a really creative and, and innovative approach. He photo excites a cofactor like NADH or FMN in order to create, it. and this excited state will reduce the substrate, generate a radical, and then the enzyme active site is going to control what's going to happen to that radical. So he can get enzymes to do completely different kinds of chemistry, and I'm looking forward to hearing some more details about your work. Great, well, uh, thank you so much for, for the introduction and for uh, the opportunity to, to come back to Minnesota. I haven't been here in, in a few years, and so it's a, a really great opportunity to, to come back and, and revisit the campus and, and have an opportunity to, to share some chemistry with you all. And so today, what I want to tell you about uh, is just sort of one story that my group has been working on over the last uh, four to five years. And I think what we found through the, the course of uh, developing new reactions and actually doing some protein engineering, uh, we ended up learning some, I think, pretty interesting photochemistry and, and how proteins are able to facilitate some pretty interesting electron transfer events. And so my group is, I would say, broadly interested in using enzymes as catalysts for asymmetric synthesis. And so sort of, as you can tell from my background, I'm, I'm more of a synthetic organic chemist. And so when I look at biocatalysis, what, what really excites me and my group uh, is the opportunity to use the protein scaffold and directed evolution to really control the selectivity of reactive intermediates. And so if you're thinking about sort of the power of small molecule catalysis, that would be catalysis that doesn't involve enzymes, I, I, th I think what, what's appealing to me is, is the idea that you can take sort of very simple mechanisms, merge them together in different orders to gain access to new types of transformations. And just to sort of illustrate my point, if you think about transition metal catalysis, obviously this is an area that, that as a field we've studied for say 50 to 60 years. And, and what we know is that transition metals have access to a, fu a few fundamental mechanisms. I've illustrated a few here, oxidative addition, migratory insertion, and transmetallation, uh, just to name a few. And I think one of the defining features of small molecule catalysis is the fact that the catalyst can interact and bind with many different types of substrates. In biocatalysis, we might define this as substrate promiscuity. And so you can take this inherent substrate promiscuity with a few fundamental mechanisms, merge them together in a number of different orders, and you gain access to hundreds of different chemical transformations. Now, the same holds true for organocatalysis, where again, uh, in this case, I'm just showing a, a secondary amine. It can form an enamine, a minium, singly oxidized enamine. You can exploit the substrate promiscuity to again gain access to hundreds of different transformations. Now, in biocatalysis, we tend to take a slightly different approach, and that's because we tend to think of enzymes as being very specific for a single transformation. And so uh, this is sort of illustrated in, in an enzyme like ketoreductase. The name sort of indicates what's going on, right? It's an enzyme that reduces ketones. We understand its mechanism. It's a very simple hydride transfer uh, a mechanism. And I think what we've seen in, in the context of synthetic chemistry is that these ketoreductases can bind and interact with many different types of substrates. And so I might decide, describe them as being substrate promiscuous, but mechanistically limited. And so the question that we've had in, in my group is, can we take existing enzymes that we would traditionally think of as only having access to a single mechanism, and by changing the substrate, can we gain access to new types of mechanisms that would allow us to use these enzymes in completely new ways to solve challenges in synthetic chemistry? Now, of course, we are not the only uh, group to think about this, and, and the way that I sort of break down this area is what type of reactive intermediate are you interested in using? 
And so for instance, if you're interested in organometallic intermediates, then of course you're gonna be drawn to natural or artificial metalloenzymes where the metal within the protein is really responsible for the reactivity. And then the protein scaffold is gonna provide a chiral environment and influence the reactivity of that metal center. And so uh, metalloenzymes or artificial metalloenzymes uh, have been known for non-natural chemistry for you know, maybe 50 years and have been demonstrated to do a number of, of really, I think, classic uh, organometallic transformations. If you're drawn to closed shelled intermediates that might resemble more closely what we do in organocatalysis, then you'd be drawn to enzymes like hydrolases, tautomerases, and albolases. And so when my group started, we became really interested in whether we could use free radicals within protein active sites. Now, of course, radicals are really common intermediates in, in nature for catalysis because radicals can mediate a number of different transformations. Uh, but in the context of natural reactions, they tend to be quite controlled. These are really well-evolved systems so that you can avoid uh, you know, protein degradation or protein alkylation. And so the question we had was, would there be mechanisms for forming non-natural uh, radical intermediates within protein active sites? And so what, what really sort of drew our attention uh, to, to this um, intermediate is, is the fact that it's high in energy. And so this ends up being really valuable if you're trying to facilitate different types of bond forming events because the activation barrier for various bond forming events is gonna be quite small. And so this is why areas like photoredox catalysis and electrosynthesis, uh, tools that have really sort of revolutionized organic synthesis in the last 15 years have really taken off. It's because of the, the power of the radical intermediate. Now, of course, the challenge when you use really highly activated, really reactive intermediates is that it can be very difficult to render these types of transformations asymmetric. And so there are small molecules can, that can do this, but I would say that it's quite limited by comparison to other types of, of intermediates. And so the goal in our group has been to find ways to form radicals within protein active sites, expanding the types of reactions available to enzymes, but then we're gonna use the tools of, of molecular biology and directed evolution to optimize those proteins to hopefully solve some interesting synthetic challenges. And so we've looked at this in the, in the context of a few different types of proteins. Uh, the, the one that I wanna tell you about today are, are, are flavin-dependent ene reductases. And so these are proteins that reduce activated alkenes with really high levels of selectivity. Um, ene reductases are some um, uh, members of, of that family that are referred to as old yellow enzymes because these were the first isolated and characterized uh, flavoproteins. You can buy uh, ene reductases from your favorite enzyme vendors, which is of course attractive if you are a synthetic organic chemist that doesn't have experience working with proteins. Uh, you can buy a commercial kit and think about uh, recapitulating that reactivity um, uh, without actually having to learn how to do protein expression. Now, the, the appealing features of, of this protein family is that they have uh, very broad substrate scopes. Um, they're thought to be overexpressed in response to oxidative stress, and so they're sort of general reductases. And so you can reduce activated alkenes in a variety of different chemical environments with a variety of different electron um, uh, activating groups. Now, the native mechanism does not involve uh, uh, radicals. It's actually just a simple hydride transfer mechanism. Uh, we tend to simplify enzyme active sites to their key components, and so in this case, um, in an ene reductase, we sort of view there to be four key components. Uh, the flavin cofactor, which is in its reduced hydroquinone oxidation state, two residues that bind, orient, and activate the substrate, and then a conserved tyrosine. And so what happens is the substrate binds, it's rendered more electrophilic, at which point the hydride on, on flavin can be donated to the electrophilic beta position, forming an enzyme-bound enolate that'll be uh, protonated by conserved tyrosine to provide the reduced product and now flavin in its oxidized oxidation state, uh, at which point the product can leave an equivalent of NADPH will bind, it can donate its hydride to flavin, reducing it back to the hydroquinone and priming the enzyme for another catalyst turnover. And so in this system, the enzyme moves back and forth between the hydroquinone and quinone oxidation states just using a hydride transfer mechanism. Now I think one of the, the defining features of, of flavin is that it does have access to a third oxidation state. Uh, this is referred to as the semiquinone. And to a synthetic organic chemist that doesn't work with, with proteins, you might look at the semiquinone and say this is a sort of fleetingly stable intermediate. It's known to readily undergo electron transfer events to get to more stable flavin oxidation states. But I think this is really the, the power of, of enzymes, right? Proteins have scaffolds that are able to stabilize the semiquinone, either thermodynamically or kinetically. And so what this means is that you can actually have a long-lived semiquinone within a protein environment. This is actually essential to the function of reductase domains for, for metalloproteins, for instance. 
And so the question we had in our group was, could we use the flavin hydroquinone as a single electron reductant to form an organic radical within a protein active site? And then we could take advantage of the weak NH bond on the flavin semiquinone. Um, it's this bond right here. It has a bond strength of about 59 kcals per mole. This could function as a hydrogen atom source to a variety of different organic radicals to provide the quinone. And so if you're familiar with radical chemistry, uh, one of the sort of classic reagents used in, in organic synthesis is tributyl tin hydride. Uh, this would essentially allow us to do tributyl tin hydride within protein environments and allow us to do a lot of that chemistry asymmetrically. And so we started with a hydrodehalogenation. I don't really want to talk about that. Instead, what I'd rather talk about uh, is some of the work we did uh, looking at this radical cyclization of an alpha halo ketone. And so this is a, a reaction that had been known for, for decades, was challenging to render asymmetric uh, using traditional approaches, and so we imagined that we might be able to use an, an e-reductase to do this. And so, you know, the, the, the first thing that I want to draw your attention to, because this is a point that's going to come back a few times throughout the talk, is the reduction potential of the substrate. Uh, it requires uh, minus 1.78 volts to reduce the substrate to form the organic radical. And so what that meant, uh, as we looked at the system initially, is that the initial electron transfer to, to uh, use flavin to reduce the substrate was going to be uphill by over half a volt. And so we recognized that this could be a challenge, but we didn't entirely understand how the protein would be able to overcome that thermodynamic barrier. And so we screened, uh, at this point, we maybe only had 12 different wild-type ene reductases in-house. Uh, we found that, that um, the ene reductase NCR, uh, NCR was able to do the reaction in about 20% yield, albeit as a 1.7 to 1 ratio of the desired cyclized and undesired reduced product, uh, and in 79-21 uh, ER. In synthetic organic chemistry, typically we're going to be shooting for higher than 95-5 ER. And so we engaged in a, a protein engineering campaign. Um, our approach to protein engineering is going to look fairly similar uh, regardless of, of the project, and so I can just talk you through it right now. Uh, this is your ene reductase active site. There's your flavin cofactor. There's the two residues that are uh, thought to bind and, and activate the substrate in the canonical mechanism. Uh, we choose not to mutate those because they're also really important for nicotinamide binding, which uh, we need to still be able to bind to reduce the flavin cofactor. And so we don't mutate those residues, but we mutate everything else within five to six angstroms, which accounts for approximately 20 residues. And so we'll conduct site saturation mutagenesis, identify residues that have an impact on the reaction, and repeat the process iteratively until we achieve uh, selectivities and activities that we're looking for. And so for this particular reaction, uh, we found that four rounds of directed evolution resulted in a variant that could provide product in 95.5 ER with 92% yield for the desired cyclized product with uh, less than 1% of, of the undesired reduced product. And so synthetically, we had a, achieved our goal. Uh, but I think one of the things that had sort of um, sat in the back of our heads that we couldn't really wrap our minds around was the increase in activity across the engineering campaign. You know, in theory, we haven't really changed the, the redox properties of the substrate. We knew in our characterization that we hadn't rendered flavin more reducing throughout the protein engineering campaign. And so it wasn't really clear how we were able to, to sort of increase the activity for this particular reaction. And so it's this sort of thought that was sitting in the back of our heads as we started to develop new reactions. And so one of the other reactions that we were looking at uh, at the same time was actually the radical cyclization of these alpha halo amides. Now these alpha halo amides are about a volt harder to reduce than the alpha halo ketones. And so when we did our initial screen with a number of different ene reductases, what we found is that none of them were able to do this reaction in the dark. Uh, you would just get unreacted starting material out at the end. It wasn't consumed in any way. And so we, at this point, we were looking for a way of making flavin more reducing. And, and we actually took a page from, from Nature. Nature has a, a really beautiful photoenzyme called DNA photolyase. This is an enzyme that is flavin dependent and uses light to repair cyclobutane lesions in DNA that are induced by UV light irradiation. And so mechanistically, how the, that protein works is, is fairly complex. I can sort of simplify it to one key step, which is where you, you photo excite the flavin cofactor to access an excited state that's more reducing by about two volts. And so the question we had was, could we adopt that mechanism with an ene reductase to access a more reducing excited state to be able to drive this challenging uh, electron transfer event? And it turns out you can. 
Uh, if you irradiate the system with 497 nanometer LEDs, you can now get the cyclization to occur in 89% yield with 94.6 ER. And so uh, we were, of course, uh, from a synthetic perspective, really excited to have this really great result. But we were sort of puzzled by the wavelength dependence of, of this uh, reaction. If you know anything about the absorption spectra of the flavin hydroquinone, you'll notice that it does not absorb at 497 nanometers. It's actually a better absorber around uh, 360 nanometers. And so it was clear to us that our initial hypothesis that we were just going to borrow the mechanism from DNA photolyase within an ene reductase was likely not operative. And so we ran some UV vis experiments, and one of the things we found is that when you tank the reduced enzyme and you add the substrate, you see this new absorption feature here in orange with a maximum right around 500 nanometers. And so this could be a charge transfer complex. Alternatively, it could be uh, some impurity in our starting material that was changing the flavin oxidation state. We wanted to rule that out, and so what we did is added a competitive binder, in this case sodium benzoate, the hypothesis being that if this were a charge transfer complex, sodium benzoate would bind in the active site preferentially to our substrate. It would kick out the substrate, and if it's a CT complex, that absorption feature should decrease. And that's exactly what we see. And so this was really sort of our, I think, first example with Flavin, that, that these systems are able to form charge transfer complexes. And so what happens is you have your substrate and your Flavin cofactor, when you mix them together in the presence of the protein, you form this charge transfer complex. And so I, I can give you just sort of a brief uh, aside as to how charge transfer complexes work, um, and this will sort of inform what, what I talk about next. And so in the context of synthetic organic chemistry, when we talk about charge transfer complexes, usually we're referring to them as electron donor acceptor complexes. And so these are molecular aggregates that'll form in solution between electron donors and electron acceptors. Essentially what happens is you have an electrostatic attraction between the two molecules that force them to aggregate in solution. That aggregate is actually a new molecular species with different homos and lumos. And so what happens is that when you photo excite them, essentially what you're doing is you're promoting an electron from the donor molecule to the acceptor molecule in the aggregate. When you do that, you form a radical ion pair and then that ion pair can go off and, and do interesting chemistry. And so in the context of, of our system, we think of the flavin hydroquinone as being the donor, our substrate as the acceptor. When they bind within the protein active site, they form this charge transfer complex, and when you photo excite that, you're able to promote an electron onto the substrate and form the flavin semiquinone. And so I should say that the protein is an absolutely essential component of these charge transfer complexes. If you leave the protein out and you just have reduced flavin and the substrate, there isn't a strong enough electrostatic attraction between the two to form the charge transfer complex. And so the protein is absolutely essential for this electron transfer. Now what we didn't appreciate at the time was how important it is for the electron transfer. Now, now, the other part that I want to dive into, and I'll be honest, this is a lot of physical chemistry and it's probably well beyond what I actually fully understand, but we understand it in sort of qualitative terms, which helps us understand how this is working. So uh, Mulliken had described charge transfer complexes using this very simple equation. So the wavelength of the absorption of the charge transfer complex is equal to the ionization potential of the electron donor the electron affinity of the electron acceptor, and then this Coulombic term, which essentially describes the electrostatic attraction between the two molecules. And so we can, we can actually sort of measure a lot of these terms. If you think about the ionization potential of the donor, that actually relates pretty closely to the oxidation potential of your electron donor. The electron affinity can be related to the reduction potential of your electron acceptor. And then the Coulombic term, which is this electrostatic term, can actually be, be simplified to the distance between the donor molecule and the acceptor molecule. And so this is the equation that we have sort of thinking or, or floating around in the back of our heads as we started to do some more protein engineering on these photoenzymatic systems. And so one of the things we wanted to do early on was increase the photon efficiency of this particular cyclization. And so we developed a, a protein engineering platform to be able to evolve a photoenzyme. Uh, up to this point, no one had actually evolved a photoenzyme because there aren't that many photoenzymes in nature. There's only three. And so what we developed was a system where you have these 96 well LED arrays. You run the reactions in white microtiter plates with clear bottoms. It's really important that they're white. If they're black, they'll absorb a lot of light and then they become very warm and they actually melt and warp 
Uh, so you want to use white ones. Uh, we cover them with clear plastic uh, covers. And then what you don't see on either side are a, a, a sea of USB fans that blow over the top of it to try and keep the temperature below 40 degrees. If you do that, you get consistent results across the plate and can do protein engineering. And so uh, these are our modified conditions. The wild type enzyme gives us 19% uh, yield, 91.9 ER, quantum efficiency of 2.4%. Uh, in a lot of our systems early on, we found T36A was the best variant for this reaction. Uh, I'll be completely honest, that was an accidental introduction into the protein. Uh, we got our initial hit with that protein, realized it was a mistake, removed it, and it turns out that it had a beneficial effect on the reaction. And so we sort of think of it as a, an unofficial first round of, of directed evolution. And so what you'll notice is the T36A variant gives higher yield, higher enantioselectivity, and higher quantum efficiency. And then at this point, we did one round of air-prone mutagenesis, tested about 1,000 variants, and found this triple mutant that we refer to as G6 that has two mutations on the surface, one within the protein active site, that gives us product in 90% yield, 97.3 ER, and now we're getting close to 11% quantum efficiency. And so we've continued the protein engineering campaign on the system, uh, but in truth, we have actually shifted towards exciting with red light in this engineering campaign rather than blue light, and I'll get into that in just a second. And so having found a, a more effective variant, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was understand other changes that we see in the protein. We didn't see large changes in, in the absorption of the charge transfer complex, and so uh, we collaborated with Greg Scholes' group at, at Princeton to try and understand uh, if there were any differences in the radical lifetime. And so the way that we gauge radical lifetime is using transient absorption spectroscopy. And, and essentially the spectral signal that we look for in that system is, is the flavin semiquinone. Because if we have flavin semiquinone, it means that we've got radical character on the substrate. And so what we found is that when you look at the wild type enzyme, the radical lifetime is about 700 picoseconds. If we look at our evolved Gluer G6 variant, we see that that radical lifetime decreases to less than five picoseconds. And so what this suggested to us is that we're shifting from a mechanism that maybe looks a little bit more stepwise in nature to one that's a bit more concerted in nature. And so we ran the requisite control experiments, and one of the things we found is that it's really important to have the alkene in the substrate. And so uh, the importance of the alkene coupled with the, the results from the transient absorption spectroscopy, what we believe is going on is within the protein active site, the electrons in the pi system of the alkene actually interact with the carbon chlorine sigma star in a hyperconjugative interaction. And so the protein is actually forcing that pi system and that antibonding orbital to interact with one another. And so you get something that looks like this in the radical anion form. And so what that means is that those pi electrons can actually help to break the carbon chlorine bond. In doing so though, you also get carbon-carbon bond formation in that transition state. And so we think that what we're evolving for is sort of a concerted asynchronous transition state that looks something like this, where we actually don't have a lot of free radical character. You have sort of a transient radical um, that, that quickly helps stitch everything up uh, to, to form the product. And so that was exciting and really unexpected. And with that sort of hypothesis in mind, then we went back and started to think about the impact that, that those types of interactions would have on the charge transfer equation. And so I've sort of simplified it here um, we're able to quantify the, the redox properties of the flavin cofactor, uh, that would be this ionization potential, and we know that that doesn't change. Our hypothesis, and this has now been supported with some computations, is that the distance between the donor and the acceptor molecule is decreasing over the course of the protein engineering campaign. And so we're forcing the donor and the acceptor to pack more tightly with one another. And so we think that we're decreasing that distance. And then we're thinking about, you know, if, if we have this hyperconjugative interaction, what impact does that actually have on the electron affinity of the acceptor? And I think the, the way to think about this is actually just to look at the redox properties of alpha halo carbonyl compounds. So when you're looking at, at the reduction potential of, say, an alpha halo carbonyl to form an alpha acyl radical and the anion, that, that potential does not track with electronegativity of that X group. It actually tracks with the stability of the anion. And so uh, alpha bromoamides are much easier to reduce um, than say alpha fluoroamides because of the stability of that anion. And so we started to think about this in the context of, of a chemistry where you have a more concerted transition state. Uh, in, in the case of say Gluer 
uh, T36A. If we don't think there's a strong hyperconjugative interaction, then you'd have this sort of radical alpha to the carbonyl. It can obviously delocalize into the pi system, but there aren't sort of st other stabilizing interactions. If you were to have this hyperconjugative interaction, the radical that you form would actually be delocalized over three carbons. And so it's actually a more stable radical than what you would form if you don't have that hyperconjugative interaction. And so we think that when you have this more ordered transition state where you're packing everything more tightly together, you're changing the distance and that also changes the electron affinity of the acceptor. And so it's difficult to sort of deconvolute those two terms in the charge transfer equation. Okay. So we've looked at a number of different cyclizations. I, I don't want to go through all of them in, in great detail. Uh, wh what we've done recently is actually move to intermolecular systems. And, and this sort of came about prior to our, our better understanding of how these systems work. And one of the, the main questions we had was, you know, if the alkene isn't an essential component of the charge transfer complex, we would expect that you would form this hydrodehalogenated product because you wouldn't have both substrates bound within the protein active site. You know, nonetheless, we set out and developed the reaction, found that you could take one equivalent of the alpha chloroamide, 2.5 equivalents of, of alpha methyl styrene with an enzyme, it's actually the same enzyme as before in cyan light. You can get the coupled product in 97% yield, 98.2 ER. In our initial screen, we found that no stock ER actually favored the opposite enantiomer, but the enantioselectivities were more modest. We ran some control experiments and, and found that there was a tyrosine within the protein active site that was actually a competing hydrogen atom source. And so we mutated that out. It was the tyrosine at position 219. Uh, and now we're able to access the other enantiomer in, in high yield and enantioselectivity. And so we're really happy to have both enantiomers. But I think the thing that, again, jumped out to us is the fact that you see less than 5% of the hydrodehalogenated product. Because what this implies is that there's a control mechanism in the electron transfer event. And again, you can see it in the UV vis. This is the absorption spectra of the flavin hydroquinone. When you add the alpha chloroamide, you see this weakly absorbing CT complex. And then when you add the alpha methyl styrene, you now see a much more strongly absorbing charge transfer complex. And so what we think this is evidence for is the fact that if you don't have the alkene, this is sort of a weakly reactive, poorly absorbing CT complex. It's only when the alkene is present that you form this more delocalized system that's a, a better sort of electron acceptor for, for the um, electron density in, in the flavin cofactor. This forms a better absorbing CT complex accounting for our observed reactivity. We've prepared some docking models. This is one that sort of recapitulates what we see in the UV vis. Um, yeah, I, I think our, our revised models now probably think that's a slightly different docking confirmation. Nonetheless, it, it does seem to work. And so we've looked at a number of different substrates. Maybe I'll just conclude by talking about uh, this ketone. So when we ran this reaction, one of the things we noticed is that the reaction immediately turned yellow. We went back and ran the controls and we found that this reaction occurs without light. And so the question we had was, if you were to change the protein, could you actually change the degree of ground state reactivity in the system? And it turns out you can. Gluer T36A only gives about 3% yield. If you move to NCR, you now get 49% yield. If you look at the consumption of the alpha halo carbonyl compound with and without alpha methyl styrene, what you find is that the, the styrene actually accelerates the consumption of, of, of the uh, alkyl halide. And so again, what we think is going on is the presence of the alkene is actually changing the distance between the donor and the acceptor and then changing the electron affinity. And so one of the other sort of uh, effects of having a decreased donor and acceptor distance is the fact that when you look at the ground state charge, uh, the ground state wave function, which should be a component of the neutral and charge transfer form, it looks as though when they pack more tightly, you get more ground state charge transfer. And so maybe I'll just conclude by saying that I think, you know, all of the chemistry, whether it's ground state electron transfer or excited state electron transfer, all involve the same mechanism. It's all a charge transfer complex. It's really just a question as to how much charge transfer there is in that ground state wave function. If there's a lot, then you can drive the reaction in the dark. Uh, if there's not, then you have to use light. And the protein is absolutely essential for dictating how much charge transfer there is. And so I had other examples, but I talked too slowly. Uh, essentially, what you have is an opportunity to develop a bunch of chemistry using light to drive the electron transfer. And then if you wanted to run these reactions on scale, you would evolve the protein, cause the CT complex to pack more tightly, and then you could drive all those electron transfers in the dark, which would be better if you wanted to scale up this type of chemistry. And so I think there's one unified mechanism and you're just in different continuums uh, of that mechanism based on the protein that you're using. And so with that, uh, maybe I will uh, conclude.
cut right through my acknowledgement slides. Uh, and just say that I think there's, there's lots of opportunities to use light with proteins. I think that charge transfer complexes and biocatalytic reactions are far more prevalent than we would think. And so I think there's lots of opportunities to take advantage of those to do really new and interesting chemistry. And so with that, I just want to conclude and thank my group for, for all their inc incredible efforts. Thank my funding sources, and I'd love to take any questions you might have. from more UV to more visible. I was just curious, do you see that your proteins are more stable um, and are able to do more turnovers as you're using more redshifted light? Yeah, so I think what we've, what we've found is that as we move to red, which is the wavelength that we're currently looking at, um, the reactor isn't quite as warm, and so the, the primary mechanism of decomposition is actually thermal decomposition. And so what we now see is uh, background non-photon mediated alkylations of cysteines and lysines in the protein. And so we're currently going through an additional protein engineering campaign to figure out which of those happen first, knock them out, and then I think we're gonna be able to really drop our, our enzyme loadings at that point. And so I, th I think we're right on the cusp of having a system that would have the, the metrics that would be sort of more similar to what an industrial biocatalytic process would look like. And so uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about that in more detail in maybe six months. Yeah. Yeah, uh, great talk. Yeah. Um, I had a question about that T36A mutant. Yep. It's so far away from the active site based yep. off of your picture. Do you think it's just controlling sort of like maybe this extended polarity network in the enzyme that just, if you shut that one off, then you induce more charge transfer in your active site? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. We've got crystal structures of both of them. If you overlay them, they look almost identical. Um, and so our thought was, oh, you know, it's, there's some change in the dynamics of the protein that, that's causing it. Uh, something that was really interesting is we started collaborating with Andy Ellington, who has this really interesting machine learning approach for identifying uh, residues at the periphery that should influence reactivity. And one of the residues that they found was T36A, but they predicted a different mutation. We went back and mutated to it, and um, within our group, we sort of refer to those as the super gluers because they actually work a, a lot better and have higher activity. And so we don't entirely understand how it's affecting it, but it looks like there's a, a couple different ways of being able to identify the importance of that residue. Awesome, and then I had one more question, yep. and I think you alluded to it with Ambika, but since you're using this, uh, these radicals in your protein, uh, ha have you seen any post trans like different uh, modifications as a result of that of the protein? like? an oxidation event that wouldn't occur in the wild type protein or anything like that? So on uh, reactions that are initiated reductively, we don't really see radical alkylation of residues within the protein. There is sort of this ionic substitution-based uh, alkylation strategy or mechanism, but that doesn't seem to be operative for you know, modifying tyrosines or tryptophans, which you might expect from a radical mechanism. What we have seen is that if the protein doesn't have sort of an organized transition state, what looks to happen is that you'll alkylate the flavin cofactor. Once you alkylate the flavin cofactor within ene reductases, then its reactivity stops. Awesome, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you.